Hey, thanks for tuning into this message from Pastor Skip Heitzig at Calvary Church. We're going through the book of James, and in this message, you're going to hear five steps to solving conflict. That is a message that you need to hear because that is a message that everyone needs to hear. Hope that you have people in your life that you can watch service with. We call it a watch party. We'd love to help you find one at calvarynm.church slash locations. Turn to the book of James, chapter 4. It's called adulting. It's all about Christian maturity. And so we're going to be in James chapter 4. Before we get into our Bible study, though, I just want to say a few words about uh, the Olympics. Uh, I love watching Olympics, winter or summer. I've always loved them. And typically, I like the opening ceremony of the Olympics. Uh, But this year, I was offended as we're over several billion others on the earth at a very crude and lewd depiction of the Last Supper by um, um, the trans community and um, drag queens kind of dressing up like the depiction of Jesus and the disciples at the Last Supper. Some are trying to walk that back and say, no, it's about Dionysius, but everyone else in the world understood it to be a mockery of the Last Supper. And um, listen, I expect the world to be worldly. I don't expect them to live at a high standard, but on purpose, they crossed the line. And the reason I'm bringing it up is I just want to say to the church, to to believers, two things. Number one, um, learn to tell time. Understand what day we're living in. The Bible says, in the last days, men will be lovers of themselves, proud, arrogant, blasphemers. And it says in 2 Peter chapter 3, that in the last days will be scoffers who laugh at the truth and do every evil thing they desire. Ozzie and Harriet don't live here anymore. They've long vacated. The cleavers are gone, and we are living in a world that more and more is aiming its sights at not religion per se, but the Christian religion, Christianity in particular. They wouldn't have dreamed of mocking Muhammad at the opening ceremonies of the Olympics because of the fallout that would occur, or for that matter, just about any other religious system. The second thing, besides knowing what time that we're living in, is we need to start being willing to get involved in the public square, to make our voices known. Now is not the time to be timid and to go, oh, well, whatever, they do what they do. Now is the time to let our voices be heard. And um, I know that one of the one of the most famous lines people like to use to keep Christians' voices quiet is the misunderstanding of what is called the separation of church and state, which, by the way, is a phrase not found in the Constitution at all, but found in a letter by Thomas Jefferson. And what he meant by that is that the state, the government, has no right to interfere with any expression of uh, religion, but rather... Um, We have the free discourse in the public square, and the government should have no say in what we do and say. That is how it was originally put. So uh, now is the time for us to live faithfully as believers and to speak boldly and to act decisively, I would add. Somebody once said, the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. So let's stop doing nothing, and let's, let's let our voices be known, and let us seek for ways to be involved. Okay, now let's have a Bible study. Turn to um, the book of James, chapter 4. Let's pray together. Father, we realize what kind of times we live in. We ask for your grace. Uh, we pray, Lord, that um, we wouldn't be seen as reactionary, but Father, we would respond to the era, the time in which we live in a faithful way that honors you and that boldly, unashamedly lifts the name of Jesus Christ. We ask it in his name. Amen. 
Um, James chapter 4. Have you discovered James is a hard book to read? It's hard-hitting, is it not? I would even say that perhaps the most difficult journey we've had as a church, uh, at least that I can remember, is going through uh, the book of James. Very hard-hitting. You may remember the old joke of a man who saw a guy hitting his thumb with a hammer over and over and over again, and he walked up to him and said, why on earth would you hit your thumb with a hammer? And the man said, because it feels so good when I stop. (laughs) And you might feel that way after we're done on Sunday morning. Finally, he stopped. Now it feels much better. Well, um, we're about to make it a little bit tougher yet. James chapter 4, James turns up the heat, so... Um, If you're thinking of leaving in the middle of the sermon, you may want to do it right away uh, to save yourself the embarrassment. But there is an obvious contrast. As tough as it has been so far in the book of James, very honest, very blatant, chapter 3, verse 18, ends with the note of peace. Look at it, verse 18 of chapter 3, the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Now we get into chapter 4 and notice the change in tone. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? Now you'll notice that James begins chapter 4 by asking another question. He's done this a lot in the book. He asks question after question. In this section, he asks four different questions. And the only thing I want to say about that is that was an ancient method of teaching. The rabbis would often teach their students by asking them questions, then providing an answer. Uh, Socrates, the Socratic method, was the diatribo, the diatribe asking questions to lead their students along a line of truth to an obvious conclusion. So he asks a question, but this is a question about the origin of conflicts. What is the source of conflict and fights? Somebody once said the most persistent sound that reverberates through man's history is the beating of war drums. War has been a part of our culture ever since we have been on the earth. It is even estimated that in the last 3,400 years of recorded history, now mind you, there are many more years of history, but there are 3,400 years of recorded history. In the last 3,400 years of recorded history, only 268 of those years have been years of peace. What that means is only less than 8%, to be precise, 7.78% of world history has been a time of peace. So then peace is that brief moment in history when everyone stands around reloading, right? Getting ready for the next fight. Well, because of this, there is a growing field known as conflict resolution. You can even get a master's degree in conflict resolution. Some of you may actually have such a degree. If you do, you will be very helpful in solving disputes between individuals or between groups in organizations or perhaps making it all the way up to the United Nations where you would be used on peacekeeping missions or helping solve conflicts within local communities around the world. Conflict resolution. James brings up conflict, but what James is talking about is a very particular kind of conflict, and that is conflict within the church. Conflict within the church. Did you notice the question, where do wars and fights come from among you? He's writing to brethren, we have noted. He's writing to believers. Where do these fights come from among you? he asks. We've already seen some hints of conflict in the book of James. For example, in chapter 2, James notes the class conflict 
between the rich and the poor. In chapter 3, he writes that there are some among them who want to be known as teachers, creating division and strife among the people. Also in chapter 3, uh, some who boasted of worldly wisdom that James describes as bitter envy and self-seeking. And the result of all of that, notice, if you will, chapter 3, verse 16, where he says, where these exist, confusion and every evil work is there. He's talking about the church. Now, I bring this up, and I'm underlining this idea for this reason. From time to time, some people will criticize the modern church, saying that we need to get back to the purity and the simplicity of the early church. Oh, really? Like the early church in the book of James? Like the early church at Corinth? If you know anything about the church at Corinth, you knew they were riddled with problems. Those are examples of the early church. So this has been going on for a long time. i reminded of a young father who heard a ruckus in the backyard. His kids had their friends with them. They were playing, but they seemed angry like they were in a fight. And so he went in to intervene, and his son said, It's okay, Dad. We're just playing church. <laughs> or perhaps you've heard of the Irish church that had this little saying as one of its mottos. Uh, they would say, to dwell above with those we love will certainly be glory, but to dwell below with those we know, well, that's another story. <laughs> okay, bad Irish accent aside, let's look at James chapter 4, where I want to give you five steps to overcoming conflict. Five steps to overcoming conflict, and this will work if it's a marriage conflict, if it's a conflict with a neighbor or a coworker or whatever, five steps to overcoming conflict. First step, recognize the source. Recognize the source. Verse 1, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. First thing that strikes us is James says the real problem is not on the outside. The real problem is on the inside. The conflict isn't because of external reasons, but internal reasons. And what is that reason? It's called our sin nature. We all have it. By the way, this is why conflicts are rarely resolved internationally, because there's no admission of personal guilt. The worldview of most of humanity is not that I have a problem, but you have a problem. And my only problem is the problem that I have with you, because you have a problem, you are the problem, or they are the problem. There's no admission that we are all sinners, all warped and broken by sin on the inside, and therefore we all need redemption, which is what the Bible teaches. But you'll notice that James says, where do they come from? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members, that is, the members of your body, the different aspects of your physical body? Now, look at the word pleasure. The Greek word here is hedone. Hedone is where we get the word hedonism. You've heard of hedonism. A hedonism is the belief that pleasure is the chief goal of life. Now, I need to say that pleasure is not sinful per se. God made all things for us richly to enjoy. But when pleasure becomes the driving force of one's life, 
It's problematic. And it's a mark of unbelievers, not believers. Ephesians chapter 2, Paul writes, All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. So, James says, war is simply the extension of man's struggle with sin in a fallen world. And when there's war on the inside, it's going to spill over to war on the outside. And I think you would agree that many conflicts that we have had or that we see is a result of selfishness. Think of the last time, if you're married, that you had a conflict with your spouse. Do you remember when that was? Could have been a year ago, could have been 20, 30 minutes ago, probably not 20 minutes ago, we were in worship, and I hope your relationship isn't that bad. But if you think back to your last conflict, you probably recognize that the real problem came down to this. You didn't please me. You didn't meet an expectation of you that I had. You didn't fulfill that. Or maybe you think of conflict within a church, church splits. Typically, churches split because people don't like other people in the church, or they don't like church policy, or sometimes they don't like the pastor. I'll let you in on a secret. I don't like the pastor here all that much either. Or when it's a national or international conflict. Some wars start internationally because certain leaders of nations want more land, want more assets, feel it is their right to invade, etc. Now go back to our text, and can you feel the pride in some of these words? Notice the personal pronouns. I'm going to read through it again, but I'm going to accentuate that on purpose. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Very, very self-centered ideology. There's something troubling about what I just read, though. If James is writing to the church, and he is, he's writing to brethren, why would he say you murder? We hope he is using that as an exaggeration, right? A hyperbolic way of expressing it. You know, we like to say, if looks can kill, right? Not meaning that you would actually kill somebody, but you're looking at them as if you could. So maybe he's using this in the sense of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount where he said, if you hate your brother, you're guilty, essentially, of murdering. Or it's possible that James actually meant that among these congregations scattered throughout Asia Minor, one or more of them had a murder, a literal murder. Now, that wouldn't be too far-fetched. We've even seen that here in this church. So it could be that there was a scandal in one or more of these congregations where there was an actual murder that took place in the church. R. Kent Hughes, a great commentator on this book, reminds us that many of the new Jewish believers at that time came from a group called the Zealots. You familiar with that term, the zealots? It's actually a political party in the New Testament. And they believed they had the right to kill people that disagreed with them politically. They could be part of the source of the problem that he is mentioning. Now, here's what we notice as we dig into these verses. Not only does this internal conflict spill out into relationships with other people, but it also spills out into our relationship with God. Look at verse 2. You fight in war. That's with other people. Yet you do not have because you do not ask. And some of your translations say, because you do not ask God. That is what is implied. 
Now, he's not saying, you know, if you would only pray about it, God would give you all your selfish desires. He's not saying that at all. What he is saying, however, is that you ought to, by prayer, have left it with God and walked away. Leave it with him. Trust him with it. Yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask, verse 3, that is, you pray about it, and you do not receive because you ask amiss, or for the wrong motive, that you may splend it or spend it on your pleasures. Have you read Psalm 37 where David said, delight yourself in the Lord? Do you know the rest of the verse? And he will give you the desires of your heart. Beautiful text, often misinterpreted to mean just get into God and he'll give you every one of your little heart's desires. I don't think that's what it means. I think what it means is when you make much of God and put him first and seek his glory, you delight yourself in the Lord, God will actually give you his desires. Implant the right desires in your heart. He'll give you the desires of your heart so that what you desire is what God desires. What James says is even when you pray, you ask amiss. I hope you realize that not all praying honors God. Not all prayers are pleasing to God. You, you recall that Jesus gave a story about two men. This is Luke chapter 18. He said, two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, the other was a tax collector. And it says this, he said, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. He wasn't, even, he wasn't even addressing God. He just wanted to pray out loud and listen to himself praying and go, man, I'm good. That was an awesome prayer I just said. So he stood and he prayed with himself, and this is what he prayed. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, unjust, adulterers. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess, and I especially thank you that I'm not like that guy, the tax collector. Jesus continued and said, well, that tax collector was so ashamed he wouldn't even lift his eyes toward heaven, but he beat on his breast and said, oh, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus said, it's that man, not the first man, that, that man that was justified and right before God because he had the right attitude of heart. You see, some of our prayers that should be thy kingdom come, thy will be done, are actually more my kingdom come, my will be done. And James says as much. The, the conflict starts on the inside, spills to the outside, and even affects your prayer relationship. I wrote something down that I found helpful. I hope you find this helpful as well. When you pray, when the request is not right, God says no. When the timing is not right, God says slow. When you're not right, God says grow. But when the request is right and the timing is right and you are right, God says go. So James is saying God doesn't always say go because you're not right or the request is not right you're actually praying amiss. So, first step, recognize the source. Second step to overcoming conflict, realize the consequence. Realize the consequence. What is that? Look at verse 4. Adulterers and adulteresses, exclamation point. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the Scripture says in vain, the Spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, but he gives more grace? Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. This is very serious language, even harsh. I mean, to 
Talk to somebody in your church and say, adulterer, adulteress. And again, you know, you, you end chapter 3 with peace and righteousness, and so you, you wonder, so did James like go to lunch after chapter 3, and then he had a really bad lunch experience, and now he's in a bad mood? No, I assure you that didn't happen. What is happening is this. He is addressing a Jewish audience, very familiar with the metaphor adulterer, adulteress, because in the Old Testament, there are several prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, who all employ this term referring to God's own people. Why would God use that term referring to his own people? Because they were unfaithful to the relationship they had with God. They were, in effect, spiritual adulterers. They were going out on God, even though they had a covenant with God. That's the idea of adulteresses or adulterer. Here's the point James is making. You can get to a point when you are striving for what you want so much that you not only fight other people and alienate other people, but you find yourself fighting God and alienating God, making God your enemy, ruining the relationship that you have with God because God doesn't want to be your enemy. He wants to be your friend. Jesus said to his own disciples, from now on, I don't call you my servants. I call you my friends. That's the relationship God wants to have with us. Now, when, when James is writing this, he is not suggesting that they could lose their salvation, but he is suggesting that they can flatline their relationship with God by holding on to strife. Think of it. Jesus said to Peter, his friend, get behind me, Satan. Remember when Jesus said that to Peter? Get behind me, Satan. You are not thinking like God thinks, but like man thinks. Why would he say that? Because Peter was acting like an enemy, not a friend. Peter was trying to keep Jesus from fulfilling the will of his father by going to the cross. Likewise, we can do the same thing. Did you know that you can be a Christian, but a worldly Christian? Have you heard the term carnal Christian before? It's right out of 1 Corinthians. The first few chapters, it, it pops up a few times. Carnal Christian, or I couldn't address you as spiritual, but carnal. This is how Paul wrote it. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as carnal, as babes in Christ. Who is he writing to? He's writing to Christians, to believers. But believers who are fighting, quarreling, and dividing. Just like we find in the book of James. To be carnal is to be caught between two spheres, flesh and spirit. Two kingdoms, the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. I would describe a carnal Christian this way. He has enough of Jesus to be saved, but he has enough of the world to be miserable while he's saved. He could be so much better off, so much happier, but like a spiritual fence sitter, not knowing really which way to end up, a little bit like Jesus today, a little bit like the world tomorrow, and they're sittering and sitting and tottering on the fence, knowing that fence, not knowing that fence is about to crash down. And you fall on one side or the other. So recognize the source. Second, realize the consequence, what it is costing you spiritually. Third step in overcoming conflict, Repent of your attitude. Repent of your attitude. Verse 7 through 10. Now, let me tell you something as we read this. Verses 7 through 10 are a series of commands. Short little, there's 10 of them. Short little staccato commands. One after the other. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. 
Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, your joy to gloom. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. We always underline that last verse. We usually don't underline the verse right before that. But that's a whole series of commands. I'm going to take you first to verse 8, because this is the proper order in real life. The proper order in real life is repentance must take place as soon as you discover you've offended God. Verse 8, the second part, he says, Purify your hearts, or cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Those are ceremonial words. A Jewish priest would wash their hands before a sacrifice. That's the language he is employing for his Jewish audience. But then, verse 9, lament and mourn and weep. You see, there's, there's nothing, there's not even a hint of make an excuse for yourself. You know, just tell people, well, I'm Irish. I get upset. It's just sort of who I am. Or, well, I, I'm hot-blooded Hispanic. You know, it's just, it's the way we are. No excuses. He says, lament, mourn, and weep. These are all words that describe repentance. Turning from what you know is wrong as soon as you discover that it is wrong. In the Bible, unbelievers are told to repent. But did you know that believers are also told to repent? In 1 John chapter 1, John writes, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Then in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, Jesus writes seven little short letters to seven church congregations, seven letters to seven churches. In six of those seven letters, Jesus tells the churches, repent, 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 repent. He tells them to turn from something that is offending him. And repentance means I acknowledge that what I am doing or living like is not pleasing to God, and I mourn because of it. That's the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, followed by blessed are those who mourn. That's salvation. You first recognize I'm poor in spirit, I'm poverty stricken before God, I have nothing that I can earn my way to earn God's favor, I got nothing, I'm bankrupt, and I thus mourn over it. And Jesus said, happy or blessed, happy are those who mourn. The quickest way to joy is to mourn over what you know is standing in the way of joy, which is sin. So, James is very upfront about this, and uh, I was reading a little book called Sold Out by two authors, Richard Gantz and William Edgar, one little quip in particular, they wrote this, churches want to hear nice, optimistic messages free of the mention of sin or a call for repentance. Churches want nice, lean programs directed at nice, clean families leading to growth without sacrifice. They want their organization to become bigger and bigger even as their God becomes smaller and smaller. If you want your God to be bigger and bigger and your life to be better and better, then at some point we must repent of the attitude that is fighting God and his people to get our own way. So to resolve conflict, you recognize the source, it's within. Realize the consequence, it hurts my relationship heavenward, and repent of our attitude. Fourth step to overcoming conflict, resist the devil. Verse 7, resist the devil. Therefore, submit to God, verse 7, resist, I love this, resist the devil, 
and he will flee from you. Why would James feel the need to mention the devil when talking about conflict resolution? Easy answer. Because the devil is the one who wants you to fight your brother. The devil would love it if instead of fighting the real enemy out there, you fight each other with your swords and cut each other to pieces. You see, the devil was the original fighter. He was the original rebel. Satan started the first war, a war in heaven that took out a third of the angels with him. He wanted what he wanted opposed to God's way. And when you lift yourself up and strive to get your way, you are following in his footsteps. Also, when you resist the temptation to always be in control and have your own way, you are resisting the nature of Satan who wants you to act that way. Have you ever read The Screwtape Letters by C.S. Lewis? Anybody remember that book? Okay, I'm surprised that only a few of you have. I'd, I'd like to see an honest show of hands if you've read the book. Okay, so for the rest of y'all, before you kick the bucket, Read that book once, at least. You'll get some tremendous insight into the temptations of Satan in your life. C.S. Lewis wrote it as if the devil, named in the book Screwtape, is discipling a young demon on how to ruin people's lives. And he says this, My dear Wormwood, this is Satan writing, My dear Wormwood, the church is a fertile field if you can keep them bickering over details, structure, money, property, personal hurts, and misunderstandings. But look at verse 6. And I love this. But he gives more grace. We need a good injection of positivity about now. But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. That's good news, but it's sobering news. What verse 6 tells me is that if you don't resist the devil, you just might find that God will resist you. Because if you don't resist the devil to make you proud and awesome, and I want you to know how cool I am, if you don't resist that, God resists you because God resists the proud. You see, you are never more like the devil than when you are proud. You are never more like Jesus and when you humble yourself. Now, let me give you a fifth and final step in overcoming conflict. Finally, rest in God. Rest in God. I actually might edit that and say, run to God. Notice in verse 7, 8, and verse 10, this composite command. Verse 7, therefore submit to God. Verse 8, draw near to God. In verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. See, it's, it's one thing to resist the devil. It's quite another thing to rest in God. It's one thing to run from the devil. It's another thing to run to God. Much better than seeing the backside of the devil is to see the face of God. So, to sum it up, this last point, I would just simply say, pursue an intimate relationship with Christ. Don't settle for anything short of an intimate, personal relationship. None of this, I go to church once a week, maybe, every now and then. I think of God from time to time. Pursue an intimate, personal relationship. To use Jesus' words Abide in me. The word abide means maintain a close, intimate connection with me. Abide in me. He said this, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it will be done for you. Verse 7, submit to God. It's a military command. It means to line up under God's authority. Like a soldier would take orders from God. Any of you in the military? Ever? Okay. Correct me if I'm wrong, but if your commanding officer tells you to go do something, but tells another soldier to go do something else, 
Do you say, wait a minute, I like what he's doing better. I want to do that. I don't want to do what you told me to do. Would, it, would that happen? No, it wouldn't happen. Submit to God. Line up under God. All of that to say this. If you say, I gave my life to Christ. Did you? Did you really give your life to Christ? Did you hand your life over to him? And say, it's yours. I am all yours. Because if you did give your life to Christ, then why are you complaining that you don't have something? If you gave your life to Christ, then why are you jealous of somebody else's lot in life? If you gave your life to Christ, why are you fighting another brother or sister? Let God be God. Let God call the shots. Rest in Him. Rest in Him. Leave things with Him. And I love verse 8. This is where we must end. Draw near to God. He will draw near to you. If you go after God, He'll go after you. Don't you love the story of the prodigal son? Don't you love the part in the story where the prodigal son wakes up and goes, uh, duh, what am I doing? I gave up everything. I'm going back home. I'm going to beg for mercy. And he starts going back home, and the story says, Jesus said, when his father saw him afar off, what did he do? He ran. He ran towards him, and he embraced him, and he welcomed him. You make one step toward God, and he will sprint to you. You move one inch toward God, and he will run to you. That's how much he loves you. We pursue the God, this is one of our axioms, who passionately pursues a lost world. So, draw near to God. God will draw near to you. And if you do these five things, there are probably others that would help, but James gives us these five steps. Recognize the source. Realize the consequence. Repent of the attitude. Resist the devil. Rest in God. And so many of the conflicts you have will go away. They'll go away. Father, the last thing we want to do is find ourselves fighting the very God who wants to be our friend. To turn our friend into an enemy by us resisting you or fighting against your people would dishonor you. So we, we want to not only resist the devil, but we want to run to you and we want to rest in you, leave our affairs in your hands, let you call the shots in our lives, leave things with you, trusting that Father knows best. We want our relationship with you to be clear and open, where we, when we do something that is amiss, that is self-aggrandizing, selfish, to stop, to turn from it, to ask your forgiveness, to seek reconciliation with others, and to move ahead in a normal, healthy, spirit-filled manner. Finally, our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. You know, it could be some of you have been fighting God. You've been pushing Him away. He would love to run to you and embrace you, but you never even showed up around the corner. Yeah, you'll come to church from time to time. You'll, you'll placate your husband or wife or your parents or your children, or somebody who invites you. You'll, you'll go, but you haven't, haven't yet committed your life to him. That's your choice. Nobody's going to force you to do it. In fact, Jesus even said this, I stand at the door and I knock. He's a gentleman. He won't kick the door down. He'll just knock at the door of your heart, and he'll say, open that door. I'll come in if you let me, but I, I'll stay outside if that's what you want. But why not move toward him 
with a step of faith and find the lavish love, forgiveness, and with it a sense of joy and purpose in living your life. You've tried so many other things. Why not try giving your life to the one who gave you life to begin with? If you've never done that and you would like to do that, I want to give you an invitation to do that as we close this service. If you've come and you realize that your life is lacking, you're willing now to put your faith in Jesus, or maybe you wandered away from him from a commitment you made some time back, but you want to come back home to him. If that describes you, I want to pray for you, but I'd like to know who it is I'm praying for, and I'd like you to raise your hand up in the air if you're willing to say, Jesus, I want to trust you this morning. I want to give you my life. Just raise your hand up. By raising your hand, you're just saying, Skip, pray for me. This is the day I'm going to make my decision to follow Christ. God bless you and you right there in the middle, a couple of you, a few of you, anyone else. In the back to my right, right up here toward the front. This is a good place and a good time to do that. Thank you in the back to my right, a few of you in the middle section I'm seeing. Yes, awesome. Father, thank you for these uh, who's raised their hands. This is a work we believe that God, that you have done and are doing in these lives. This is not manufactured by us. This is not some guilt thing we're trying to push on people. This is a sovereign work of your Holy Spirit in the lives of men and women, convincing them of their need to be saved and to be safe in your hands and in your covenant. Strengthen them, we pray. I pray that you would give them a whole purpose for living, a whole new lease on life filled with joy and the peace of the Spirit that is promised in the Word of God, a sense of wholeness and satisfaction. We pray you do that today for them in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand to your feet, please? We're going to close in a song. If you raise your hand, I'm going to ask you to take an even bolder step than raising your hand. I'm going to ask you now to get up from where you are standing, find the nearest aisle, walk forward, and when you're all up here together as you face me, I'm going to lead you in a prayer that makes Jesus the center of your life. You're going to give your life to Christ here, and you're going to do it publicly. So as we, as we sing this song, get up and come and stand. Make a bold stand. Let us encourage you. Let us encourage you in that. Come on. Come on. Come on up. God bless you, sir. Come on up. Please. Come on up. Please. So I'm guessing that the last thing you thought would happen is that you'd walk forward in front of a few thousand people and, and do this. Am I right? So I just want to say, I just want to say we call people forward not to embarrass anyone, but to encourage everyone who does. There's something about making it public that makes it real. You're, you're saying to everybody here and, and to the world, essentially, I'm making a break. I'm going public. I am taking a break. I'm leaving the kingdom of darkness. I'm entering the kingdom of light. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. That's the way to live. It's the way to live your life. You belong to him. There's a whole bunch of you up here, and I'm glad you're all up here. I want to now lead you in a prayer. I'm going to pray out loud. I'd like you to say these words out loud after me. Say them from your heart. Mean them as you say them. Let's pray. Say, Lord, I give you my life. Lord, I give you my life. I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. I believe he died for me. 
I believe he died for me. I believe he shed his blood for my sin. I believe he shed his blood for my sin. I believe he rose again. I believe he rose again. I turn from my sin. I turn from my sin. I turn to Jesus as my savior. I turn to Jesus as my savior. I want to follow him as my Lord. I want to follow him as my Lord. Help me. Help me. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What a good word that was, and so happy to celebrate the fact that every service the weekend that this message was delivered, many people gave their life to the Lord. Hey, if your life has been changed here at Calvary, we'd love to hear about it. Would you consider emailing us your story? Just email mystory at calvarynm.com church. We would love to hear that and respond to you, congratulate you as well. Finally, if you'd like to get the word out to more people, partner with us. You can click give in the top right corner of our website, calvarynm.church. God bless, and we'll see you for our next sermon.